The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome. And again, uh, a lot of our key people are, are, are traveling. They picked this time of the year to go. So uh, my security team's not here. So uh, you'll just have to answer to my wife, Jennifer. She's security for this morning. Uh, we've been uh, covering some uh, material. I believe that we're living in very difficult times right now. Uh, and the church needs to respond and understand there are pitfalls to Christian living. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's any pitfalls to Christian living? Okay, well, we don't want to give the enemy too much credit, but we are to be aware of his devices and understand it. And we've been called, when Jennifer and I traveled for about 12 years up in the New England area primarily, um, the emphasis was these are the how-to people. They labeled us the how-to people. And uh, someone just recently put a comment I see on one of the YouTubes that said, uh, well, I've always said the Bible's a lot on what to do, a little shy on how to do it, okay? And when we travel, we found so many people set free from things they knew the biblical solution. They didn't know how to apply the biblical solution. And that's uh, extremely important. It's going to be even more important in the days ahead. And uh, we're highly recommending uh, one of our more recent books on the uh, ancient blueprint because it, it covers an application for uh, people who are going to be coming during a time of great outpouring into Christianity, finding Messiah as their Lord and Savior, discovering that Jesus is for them, and at the same time they're going to have to be um, aware of how culturally brainwashed they were, and uh, coming clean from that. And the Didache uh, was, a, was a, a document before we had a New Testament. It was based on an outline of what did those new apostles, Jewish apostles, what did they teach? They didn't have a New Testament yet, so they taught what they heard Jesus say and Old Testament foundational scriptures brought into a higher dimension brought in, Jesus elevated the standard. He didn't lower the standard. He elevated it. And uh, those, those apostles taught that. You read in, in uh, the scriptures where it says they uh, remained in the apostles' teachings. But uh, it was, the Didache was like an outline. It'd be like a sermon outline. It wasn't scripture, but it was an outline of what do we do with these Gentiles who have no background? Well, that same thing's going to happen in the days ahead. You're going to, all of a sudden, we're going to see a tremendous move of God's Spirit, and it's going to do quite a bit. You know, the Holy Spirit can accomplish a great deal uh, in, in minutes in people's lives, like on the day of Pentecost, than he could over a period of a long time. Nevertheless, um, the, uh, as a pastor, uh, I'm getting communication from literally around the world, and you see certain patterns, and uh, we're going to have to get back to the basics of this is right, this is wrong. And, and, and I think the first six lessons of the Didache uh, it was there's two ways to live. And we know even from the Old Testament, there's a, there's a way of life and a way of death. And then he even gives you, the, it's like an open book test. It's, he gives you the answer. He says, choose life. All right. So um, what I wanted to cover today uh, sounds kind of negative, but the title is really the, uh, the pitfall of Christian living. Pitfalls, plural, of Christian living, which has to do with knowing what the enemy's devices are, but knowing that these things are common to man, no matter where, and there's always an, a solution. We are redemptive-oriented people, and if there was anything that we were called besides how-to, is a solution-oriented people for the things that exist. Um, the pitfall of discouragement, we're going to cover a little bit of that. Uh, 
the pitfall of weed seed attitudes. And we'll talk about what that really means. Uh, the pitfall of not really understanding your individual purpose and destiny. The pitfall of falling, failing to see um, really a redemptive revelation. Without a redemptive revelation, what? The people cast off restraint, they run wild. Without a redemptive revelation. And I've seen many courses where they're trying to encourage people to follow your dream, follow your dream. I want to know if that dream is of God or not, though. Otherwise, you're just kind of spinning your wheels. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of that out there. Follow your dream, follow your dream. But yet, that dream could be totally carnal, could be totally flesh. <laughs> it could even be somebody else's idea. You know how many parents it's still into their children to kind of live their life through them and put a false destiny into them that needs to be eradicated. And, and uh, the how-to people uh, love to eradicate and show you how to eradicate certain issues. So uh, the pitfall of pushing for position very interesting concept. You might not pay attention to that, but it's uh, very prevalent in uh, ministry, workplace, uh, and you can watch it on a Hallmark movie. It's always the choice between true love and the job, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like choose true love, all right, but ultimately, even in real life, it's choose the destiny that God's got for you because he loves you and he knows how he made you, why he made you, and he wants you to function appropriately. All right, so today um, we're going to cover some of the pitfalls of Christian living, and we're going to use this as an example, some of the greats. And keep in mind, all of the greats had their moment. So don't say, this doesn't apply to me. This is for everyone else. I'm an overcomer. I walk in total victory. Well, good for you. But so did many of the greats. And Jeremiah, I'm too young. Moses, I can't talk. You know, even the Apostle Paul that we're holding such high esteem uh, in the book of Acts, one of my favorite portions of Scripture, Jesus had to appear to him in a vision and say, do not remain silent. No one here will hurt you. I have many people in this city. What was, why would Jesus appear in a vision to say something like that if Paul wasn't thinking, I'm done talking? These people hurt you. I've been hurt. I'm the only one. I know you've never done that. You've never said, I'm the only one. I have many people in this city. But in every case throughout history, all of the greats that, that got hit with a wall of discouragement and got off track, off focus, and uh, every single one of them, God gave the same solution. I am with you. So he doesn't really tolerate your excuse, no matter how unique your excuse might be. You, nobody understands. I can still remember dealing with a, a, a man who actually cast a spirit of pride out of him. And I saw the spirit with my eyes wide open. It looked like a bald Humpty Dumpty, and it had its head tilted back. Um, he struggled with uh, sexual issues as well. But that spirit of pride was other people can get ministry, but I'm complicated. We got, we got that thing cast out too because you know what I said? And just Lord just dropped it in my spirit. Well, he's complicated. He's intelligent, well above average intelligence. Um, so he wanted a complicated answer. I said, well, you know what? The solution is easy. It's Jesus. You know, pride, I said, on one hand, is rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. Choose. Can you humble yourself? He wanted to say, I don't have a need to humble myself. But he struggled for a period of time. Humble himself, and that thing manifested. And when it manifested, his eyes turned as black as two pieces of coal. No, you hear other people that have done deliverance say it, the same thing. It wasn't just a dark eye. It was dull and black, like coal. No luster, no shine to it. And that thing came out. And also, uh, besides going out, it says, I'd like to kill you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what it likes to do and what it can do is two different things, right? And that was uh, many years ago. But anyway, 
I'm saying all of this is because uh, your I want to set people free this day, today, from the what I feel is the word of the Lord from discouragement is one of them. Uh, it's a pitfall, and it's tailor made for you. You know that we've shared this before. It's tailor made for you. You know your flesh has weaknesses, and the enemy's looking for a place. He's looking for authority. He he, he needs your permission, so it's going to be tailor made for you. Uh, all temptation is actually tailor-made for you. Your flesh has uh, an open door in some areas, so what we're going to do is close those doors. We're going to acknowledge them, humble ourselves, not be proud. That doesn't apply to me, but I know someone that that does apply to. <laughs> you know, we're not going to go there. Um, uh, matter of fact, that's the other one, selfish ambition. And it, it's real key right now in, a, in the time period that we're living in with times of pressure. There's a lot of self-promotion going on and we'll cover that because that's a pitfall all right so uh, i want to start with the pitfall i'm going to use elijah as an example because <clears throat> here we have the setting uh those of you that know the story uh, elijah was the flaming prophet who lived in a time when spiritual fires uh, were nearly extinguished by the corruption oh two words corruption and idolatry and i believe it's very indicative of even the season we're living in right now we have been culturally poisoned we've been brainwashed uh, for those who have not really thought for themselves and found out what does God say about it. And uh, same thing the Gentiles put up with, didn't they? Just think, these, these Jewish apostles had an encounter with Jesus. Their hands touched him. They handled him. They saw him. And then even after his resurrection, they said, like the Apostle John said in 1 John, he says, and we're still doing it. We're still touching him. We're still handling him. We're still fellowshipping him. And we want your joy to be full. We want you to enjoy the same thing. We want you to feel him, touch him, know him, fellowship with him, have intimate relationship with him. The pitfall of Elijah was discouragement. I and mean, I want to look at some of these things. You know, we all know Proverbs 13, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire is realized, it's a tree of life. The tactic of the enemy in every one of your cases, no exception, uh, new or seasoned Christian, his tactic is to divert you from your purpose or destiny. If he can do that, he's successful because that's where the threat lies. You were placed on planet Earth for a purpose, a redemptive purpose. And without a redemptive vision, people cast off restraint, they run wild, they do whatever they think is best. Or like in the book of Judges, you know, it was all through the book of Judges, it said the same phrase, I don't know how many times, but it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's what people do under pressure. Some people would rather do the wrong thing than Nothing. They're terrified of doing nothing. But the key to, to what we're going to cover is these attacks of discouragement can happen right before a breakthrough. So hold on there, all right? Perseverance is one of the key solutions. Hang on. The enemy wants to stop God's work in us. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So look at his mission. He's looking to devour. So take a seasoned Christian, and what's he going to do? He's not going to blatant hit you with a strength. He's going to find an area of vulnerability, a chink in your armor. And today's the day we're going to heal up those chinks, right? And don't, don't do like that guy with that spirit of pride did. Oh, that's for other people, not me. I don't need it. I'm secure. I'm safe. Because even that will be what he will use on you, even that statement alone. Thank God I'm not like other people. He will use that on you, all right? So uh, the enemy wants to stop God's work, kingdom building. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, we see it in the book of Nehemiah as well, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Remember Sanballat, he's kind of like Satan anyway. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the other Arabs and the rest of our enemies heard that we had rebuilt the wall and that there was still... Break, no breaks left in it, though, at that time, but we had not hung the doors yet. In other words, we're starting to get protection. The peace of God is guarding my heart and my mind, but, but there's doors. 
Remember, the scripture says in Ephesians, give no place to the enemy. Don't give him a foothold. Don't have an open doors. The whole key to successful Christian living in difficult times is learning to close the doors. Because he takes full opportunity of any open door. Give no place, no open door, because you're vulnerable no matter how the walls have been built over the years. Walls are good. Because uh, anyone who uh, does not have rule of his spirit. It's like a city broken down without walls. What does that mean? Oh, the enemy can really come rough, just literally run roughshod. But we're not concerned. I, we are mature people, and in that maturity, you've got some walls that are secure in him. There's some sanctified areas that are impermeable. Uh, it, they're not even legitimate temptations. Okay? But there is in every life a tailor-made attack on you. Uh, I want to share another one that I saw, the vulnerability of, of uh, not dealing with an open door. Now, this is an extreme example, but uh, some pastors called me because even as a baby Christian, uh, I was known as uh, the how-to, I think they called me the counselor then or something. Uh, Go see Dennis Clark. He, he, he gets answers where other people gave up, and some Christians from mental health uh, sent me some guy who thought he was Elijah, but he only heard Eli he only heard God talk to him when there was lightning and thunder. All right. And it was interesting as I went, wow, well, wow, this is not an easy one here, is it? Would that be easy if someone sent that to you, the guy who thought he was Elijah incarnate? And mental health sent him to me. <laughs> Baby Christian, wasn't pastoring yet. And I went, oh, God, help. Did you ever pray any of those prayers? Like, <laughs> this is a new one, all right? But all of our books are based on new ones where God gave a redemptive solution. Well, anyway, he said, I only hear God speak when there's lightning and thunder. And I go, oh. I said, do you, do you know that many of the greats in the Bible, the one common denominator they had, and he said, what? And I said, all of them had the humility to admit they could be wrong. Is it possible that you could be wrong? Well, he wanted to be like the greats, right? He struggled with that for the longest time, that he might not be Elijah. And I told him that, you know, John the Baptist was a kind of Elijah, and Elijah is one that announces, it heralds a truth. And um, I said, I can understand that, but incarnate Elijah, you are not Elijah. Could you possibly be wrong? And he finally got to the point where he went, all right, I could be wrong. I said, well, then pray with me. And we pray that he was wrong, that that's not who he really was, that, that uh, he accepted, uh, he had accepted Jesus. So this was a totally unusual situation. He had accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, but at the same time, he thought he was Elijah. He went back to mental health, and they said, what did you tell him? We've seen nothing but improvement ever since. I said, you could be wrong. So I'm giving that word to you. You know what? In some areas, you could be wrong. Oh, I could, I could just feel the glass shattering. Uh, your, your ceiling of protection has just broken. All right? That's the anointing. It breaks the yoke of bondage. You could be wrong. But anyway, in Elijah's case, <clears throat> uh, and in the, uh, the case of Nehemiah, you know, they were vulnerable. They didn't have the, the gates yet. And we're going to get back to Elijah, but <clears throat> uh, Spurgeon, how many have heard the great preacher? He's called a prince of preachers, builder of churches, uh, <laughs> author of over 200 books of sermons. Yet he faced a crisis to where he actually despaired, even thought about quitting. It happened to all of the greats in the Bible at some point. I can't speak. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to talk anymore. Jeremiah was so funny. I'm too young. And God says, you don't speak what I put in your mouth. I'm going to confound you in the front of those people. Fear not their faces. 
So sometimes you have to quit looking at faces and let the truth go forward, right? So, but Spurgeon said the thing that he learned, though, that even though he went through times of great despair, even thought of quitting, he said the discouragement came. So here's a key now. Here's a how-to key. The discouragement came <clears throat> whenever the Lord was preparing for a larger blessing for my ministry. So what's it saying? Sometimes the, the most difficult times when you want to quit, you want to move on, you want to change, more often than not, you do not need a geographical change. You need an internal change. You have to win the battle within before you're ever going to win the battle without. You know, the, there's talk about, uh, you know, the seven pillars of society and people talk about seven mountains. And I'm saying, you know what, my whole ministry has been, if you don't deal with the seven internal mountains, you're not of much value on any mountain, redemptively. You, you don't have very much influence, no matter what you are called to, whether it was religion or education or family or, um, uh, you know, businesses and what about the internal mountains? What about the mind, the will, the emotion, the spirit? What about your physical body? What about, what about all of your relationships? What about all of your possessions? If Jesus isn't ruling over those internally, your external behavior may not be redemptive. And you might be at the wrong place at the wrong time. God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which we should live, which means he set the boundaries for where you live and what you do. You know, you may not like the job you're at, but right now I say it's better off to be a, a honorable person on a stinky old job. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, that's uh, the attacks of discouragement can come before a great victory. They can even come after a victory because you're kind of set up right after a victory as well. But Elijah went down from the mountain to the valley to the desert. And believers reach really the depths of discouragement in descending steps. All right, here, you want some how-to steps? All the note takers need to write these down. And then identify which of these is, is, is trying to bring discouragement upon me. The first one in Numbers 21.4, it says, And they journeyed from... Mount Hor, by way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the hardness of the way. One way the enemy works on some people is makes it hard. Um, now, uh, I want to discredit a friend of mine, but it, it was interesting that he that he said, I was raised on the farm and it was hard work and I swore I was going to school and find a job that was not farming. But what would the enemy use on him? I mean, that may be true. So go to school, find out what God's called you to do, whatever. But the fact was he resented the work on the farm from the time he was a child. It was too hard. It was morning, noon, and night. And, and, and agriculture is that way. Uh, for, for many people. Some love it. I had a guy that, for me, I had to get deliverance on hating yard work. I had had a guy in my church who yard work was his way of relaxing. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the enemy's going to use on you what he can use on you. That was one of my favorite miracles. God says, Dennis, you're a worshiper. You've got victory over the devil. You got vision. But when it comes to the mundane things like yard work, you have it, you need an attitude adjustment. I had a weed seed attitude that I had a fine, hard time finding God when I had to do yard work. I repented, got free from it, and said, I'm gonna be the best yard work guy and cherish the fact that God gave me a yard to even take care of and I went through the whole routine and as soon as I started feeling freedom my neighbor from two doors down, uh, he wanted to buy a riding lawnmower and his wife said, no, your yard's too small it doesn't justify a yard uh, 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 a riding lawnmower she said, but if you go do Dennis's I'll let you get it 
Am I glad that I repented? Now, I had this guy who's doing my yard work for nothing because that was the only way he could get a riding lawnmower from his wife. God can move in mysterious ways, right? That's not in Scripture, but you know what he can do that, right? All right, so anyway. So the first uh, category for discouragement that he can use against you is the hardness or the difficulty of the life situation. And you can, and you have this mental capacity. Jennifer will teach the science of this. You have the capacity mentally to make things big or little. One person raises himself out of the ghetto with a, simply saying, I'm going to take all of these challenges and learn from them and overcome them. Someone else just gets crushed and gives up. You have the capacity to make a mountain or a molehill. You have the same intellectual, just intellectual, not spiritual, just intellectual. Add the Spirit of God to that, and you have the ability to be redemptive-oriented all the time. And that makes you an overcomer, and you can overcome. And there's no temptation except which is common to man, of which there's not a way, a redemptive way to respond. You need to find out out of that relationship with God. All right, the second category, there's five of these. The second category uh, for discouragement is the difficulty of the task. All right. One's the hardness of the way. Uh, It said they were discouraged because of the way. But the second one in Nehemiah was, uh, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burden is decayed and there is much rubbish (laughs) so that we're not able to build the wall. The difficulty of the task is we can't build until something is removed. And there's a key in there because that's really one of the keys to our ministry, isn't it, Jennifer? Is that, you know, you, you've got to learn that you've got to be a, a gold, God's a gold miner and he's looking for the gold. But guess what? To get to the gold in you, a lot of times you've got to deal with the rubbish. All right. So uh, never get discouraged by the rubbish, but say, well, there's something else that ain't God that I need to get rid of. <laughs> you know, we used to say, when people would manifest negatively, we say manifestation is good. Because now we know Jesus isn't ruling there, is he? Okay, we have a point to deal with something. So manifest even negative manifestation is good because it's coming to the surface. And you, you can't use it an excuse. All right, the third element is found in 73, Psalm 73, verses 2 and 3. Prosperity of the wicked. And don't tell me this hasn't ever bothered you. Have you ever seen a politician or someone on the news that is very wealthy and they get away with it? Or seemingly get away with it? Does that work on you? If you have a core value of justice, it probably does, more so than others. Um, And... uh, it's like, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had all but slipped. But I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Remember, a fool is not substandard intellect. A fool in the Bible is a self-confident rebel. All right? Proud, arrogant. Hey, I don't need God. That's good for you weak people, but I don't need that. And it appears that they prosper. Now, fortunately, David, in one of his psalms, gave this solution. Until I considered their end. Uh, and that's something God's been speaking to us lately, isn't it? When it comes to justice, is that justice delayed is not necessarily justice denied. Note takers, you got to write that down because discouragement comes in when you see all the wrongdoing and it's like nothing happens. These people don't get prosecuted. Did you notice that? (laughs) They seem like they get away with it. It seems like they prosper in their sin and injustice and greed and, and they seem like they're getting away with it. But scripture clearly says that God is a righteous judge. So leave it up to him. And again, one of the The keys to the solution to all of these is perseverance. Stick it out. It ain't over till it's over, all right? And remember, uh, when we travel, we have to say this in every church. You give power to what you give attention to. I saw anorexics that were healed 
simply by doing their homework of recognizing, and she told her psychiatrist, she says, uh, my pastor says you give power to what you give attention to. And he said, yeah, he said, that's, that's good homework if you know how to do that. And I gave her some keys on how to do that, and she started to come out of it. You give power to what you give attention to. It grows. It doesn't go under the surface. Christians are the worst at suppressing and stuffing it and thinking, I don't have to deal with that. What is suppressed will be expressed later. However, it's going to grow while it's suppressed. They're like time bombs. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And only Jesus can transform toxic emotions into fruit of the Spirit. The world does not have an antidote for toxic emotions other than Medicaid, some activity, some habit changing. What do they call that, Jennifer? She's the psychologist there. Behavior modification or something like that. They, they, they'll find little cues. But healing belongs to Jesus, and he is the healer. And the, 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 the solution is that the wicked do not prosper forever. Your focus is is going to go to discouragement, and you're going to lose sight of keeping your eyes on Jesus. So that tool might work on a, a lot of people, seeing the injustice and then seeing it. They're never getting caught. How come no one's gone to prison yet? How come they just admitted their guilt and they're getting away with it? That can get you off the focus. It isn't over till it's over. Now, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desires realize it's a tree of life, uh, this justice delayed is not justice denied. Uh, write this down: Psalm ninety-four, verse fifteen, because that's really what it's it's implying there. Justice delayed is not justice denied. Consider that a footnote to Psalm ninety-four, fifteen. If the delay in the fulfillment of your desires. It's kind of like, I have plans. I'm, uh, I've even heard uh, 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 young people say, I was going to be a millionaire by the age of 32, and I'm not. You know, design. <laughs> All, right. All right. One of the tactics that will be used on that unsaved person or a saved individual is that there is delay in the fulfillment of some of the things that God promised me. Even in some prophetic words that you felt so much life and redemption on it, how come it hasn't come to pass yet? Okay, Discouragement is probably the best used tool of the devil. I bet you if you had a tool belt, discouragement would almost be worn out and he'd have to replace the tool again. All right, Because it works so effectively on Christians. But the tactic, one of these five categories uh, fits you better than others. I don't know, maybe all five, but <laughs> uh, you know which one bothers you the most because that's the doorway. He's looking for a place. He needs permission to harass and oppress you uh, and with any great power. He needs your permission to open the door, and we're not. So the delay in the fulfillment of desires uh, could be one. Uh, the, uh, that's the fourth one. Uh, the fifth one is envy of the brethren. Now, we know all the way back from Cain and Abel. Comparing yourself amongst yourselves is foolish. But too often, the envy, how about Joseph's brothers even? He had the vision, revelation. His brothers threw him in a pit for it. I'm saying that right now, with pressure on the church at large, the pressure is going to be for you to start picking and choosing who you're offended by. And when God is trying to bring one accord, I believe uh, Jennifer's vision was, is, is very timely, and others have said the same thing. This is not a new thing. But there's going to be like little Pentecosts all around the world. And when we started this church, God said, you're not a church. You're supposed to birth a church which means I want to birth like on the day of Pentecost. I believe that there's going to be twos and threes all around the world that are going to come together in such unity that God says, there I am in the midst. And, and it's going to glow and it's going to be bright. Unity is not going to be huge numbers, by the way. It's going to be 
a series of genuine, intimate relationships with Jesus brought together, built together, a habitation of God in the Spirit. We are not individually separate. We're not an island. You can't live unto yourself, die unto yourself. Uh, America is known for being a rugged individualist uh, country, but in the kingdom of God, it's going to be we are individually part of one another. And you're not going to lose your identity becoming part of something bigger than yourself. Well, all it does is it breaks out the selfishness. Um, so let's get some steps out. Remember, the kingdom of God, perseverance applies to all five of those tactics. Whether you're jealous of people or you don't see your promises fulfilled or you're seeing the wicked prosper or you're seeing uh, uh, the difficulty of the task. How can I work in these kinds of conditions? Well, you just be the best person you can be in that stinky old job and God will prosper. Promotion doesn't come from the East or West. It's God that lifts up one and puts down another. I'm getting into storytelling time, I think, but I can still remember that. I came off of drugs, got saved, filled with the spirit, had open visions, had all this wonderful spiritual stuff and I was on welfare. That's where I'd gotten down to. Um, and God said, I want you to go get a job at this trucking place. I went there and I knew it was God. And he told me, I told him I would do anything. And he says, no, I don't need you. I was relieved because the only job they had open was cleaning the restrooms mopping the floor where the truckers would come in in the dispatch office. I went home kind of relieved that I was obedient to God. By golly, at least I went, didn't I? Huh? And God said, go again. I don't know. They already said no. I went three times to ask for a job. College education, but yet I'm going to clean toilets. Right? And the guy said, you know what? I haven't had anybody ask for a job in three years and over 40 years that I've run this trucking company. He says, you mop the hall where the truckers come in, the old fashioned mop and bucket and clean the restrooms. And when I was cleaning the restrooms, I, I used to tease Jennifer. I said, maybe it was the Clorox, I don't know. But when I used to clean the restrooms, I could feel the joy of God, and, and it was like, I felt like I was floating, and that I was obedient to God, and he was honoring it, and it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Next thing you know, that lasted for a few days only. A few days, and he, the boss came to me and said, do you know how to do payroll? And I go, yeah. Do you know how to do this? Yeah. Do you know how to do this? Yeah. He put a job together where I had my own office and my own desk, and it was the overflow of everybody else's work. It was the sum total. And he put me across from the, from the uh, uh, garage foreman. He had his, this is back in the 70s, so you got him. He had his bandana on and his earrings, and uh, he's looking at me, and he called me smiley. He couldn't stand the fact that I was happy. What do you got to be happy for? Your car won't pass Pennsylvania inspection. It's got holes in it. And, and, and he says, and, and you were cleaning toilets a little while ago. Um, look at me. And he takes off his watch. It was an expensive watch. And he smashes it against the wall. I can go buy another one. What's your God doing for you? And I had free New Testaments that were supposed to be free. That, you give them away? And I said, yeah. I said, you never bought nothing from me. I think the Chicago came back out in me that time. You never bought nothing from me. He goes, what? You hit his pride button, you know. I said, I got this Bible, unless you're afraid. How much you want for it? I had to put a price on something that was free. Five bucks. Says, here, here, keep the chain. Here's ten, keep it. And from that time on, he came to me with a, I was a speaker at a Christian businessman's lunch. You know what those are like? Those are like full gospel businessmen, women's aglow, where you have testimonies only. No preaching, just testimonies. And I was a speaker and I went and he said, um, 
<laughs> the, the guy that was giving his testimony before mine was, uh, I was in a helicopter crash, fell out, and Angel saved me. <laughs> He's going, <laughs> he sitting there like this, going, and told me, I'd be a Christian if it wasn't that I have to go back to these guys in the shop who were technically, from what I heard, murderers, hijackers, uh, drug dealers. And he, he, I never knew what happened to him because after that, an old job in a factory called me back and I left. But I did hear the story that after I left, some guy came in and the first question they asked him was, Are you a Christian? And he said, yeah. Next thing you know, I heard that they had hung him on a hook with the winch that lifts truck engines out <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the Bay Area where they worked on trucks. And I was like, they hung him on a hook. And they said, yeah, they, they made fun of him. They says, you're no Christian. We had a Christian here. We had a real one here. You're not a real one. So don't fake it till you make it. You better be a real one. Because even the world knew the difference. Of course, it was a dead giveaway, though, because he, he would go out and smoke pot with the, with the other drivers. And so they, they, they were watching his behavior. And they're watching you. So anyway, perseverance is the answer to every one of these. And the enemy has no counterattack on somebody who doesn't give up. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. There's no counterattack for that. You can't counterattack someone that says, I don't understand, but I'm not quitting. I'm getting back up. It's me and Jesus. And just like he told all the greats in their hardest moment of despair, I am with you. If that's not good enough for you, it's good enough for all of them, then you're asking for information that you don't need. You know, and sometimes there's information you don't need. You need to trust him, not in the answers. If you need it, he'll tell you. So the steps to get out of this uh, discouragement, all right? Number one, and we've been talking about this for weeks now, to get out of discouragement, you must focus. You've got to renew your focus. To renew your focus is, remember, you give power to what you give attention to. And so even if you think it's a waste of time, that's a deception in itself. Because most people would rather do the wrong thing than nothing. But I'm telling you that when you focus on the secret place, you go to Jesus in the secret place and you focus on him, you stay there, it starts to cleanse. It changes your motivation. And you get stronger. You give power to what you give attention to. And a change of focus has to be the first step. And you, and you can't get caught up in this, yeah, but you don't understand. But yeah, you know what that is? That's still an excuse, and you will never refocus making excuses. God can't heal an excuse. Repentance requires, you have to admit it, <laughs> you're wrong. Remember that time we had that guy that was, he said, I used to smoke dope with uh, some movie star. What was, what was that name? Remember? And he was sitting back there. He was proud as a peacock. He didn't need none of this teaching. And I said, uh, and I says, and when you're wrong, be 100% wrong. He was devastated. I've never been 100% wrong in my whole life. <laughs> it was always like, well, I might have been 90% wrong, but, you know, but he or she was 10% wrong. Right? You know, you know if you don't admit it, you don't ever refocus properly. You've got to admit, okay, I've given in to discouragement, or I'm, I'm vulnerable in this area, and I've got to do something constructive about it. So Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, both the author and the finisher of our faith. He is both the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. Let him be the beginning and the end, not you. Let him have the last word, not you, or your opinion. The pride of opinion has taken more Christians down in the time of discouragement. You can be so right you're wrong. 
You know, I taught uh, in my first pastorate, I taught the, the Christians to do this, and they did, they did it to one another quite thoroughly, so I hope you guys do it to one another. When someone levels with you, I'm just speaking the truth, it's like, fine, where's the love? Where's the redemption? Truth always has a redemptive solution. I'm even that way with prophecy. I pay very little attention to prophecies that warn that I don't hear a redemptive solution. And maybe they're legitimate, I don't know, but I'm looking for a redemptive God, and I know we win in the end. So if I hear doom and gloom, I still want to know, okay, and what do the how-to people want to know? How do I respond? How do I respond to the gloom and the doom? Is there a redemptive solution? Because without a redemptive revelation, people cast off restraint. And then what do they do when they cast off restraint? They do whatever they think they can do. They come to their own conclusion. They, they refer back to the reasoning mind. Now, the second thing that needs to be done is repent of your bad attitude. You know, though it tarries, wait for it, because, you know, it surely will come. It will not tarry. But you've got to admit, when you have a weed seed attitude, that it's there. Attitude determines performance. So a negative attitude will determine that result. Don't expect a good result with a bad attitude. <laughs> it's, why would you, it's, it's a contradiction of terms there. Now, if you repent of the bad attitude, and I don't want to talk, I want to talk about a little bit of weed seed attitudes too before we get too far. But uh, so the first thing is renew your focus. Second thing is repent of the bad attitude, which you have to identify. Uh, three, review your purpose. Reviewing the purpose. What did God call you to do? What did you get as a baby Christian? What scriptures did you write in your Bible when you were brand new? Because those haven't changed. Those revelations, those, things, those special things you wrote down are like a Holy Ghost railroad track so that when you get goofy or discouraged <laughs> or weak, go back to the railroad track and you'll get back on track. God only gave me one out of the Amplified Bible, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. And I know in Bible school they'll teach you the names of God and you memorize them. But I'll tell you what God had me do. He took every name and every attribute and said, you walk in that relationship until it's real. You need the reality of that love more than you need. You need the experiential love more than you need knowledge. Renew your focus, repent of the bad attitude, review your purpose. I, I just love it, and it has to be in this order, too. Here's a how-to for the how-to people that need how-tos. When it comes to purpose, look for both the internal and then the external. Because uh, the Apostle Paul said in Acts 26, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but the heavenly vision was to turn people from Satan to God. That was more ministry-oriented out there. Paul also said the more important one was, I was brought from my mother's womb that Jesus would be revealed in me. That is the primary vision. The primary is, and then he even says in that scripture uh, that, that Jesus would be revealed. I was taken from my mother's womb. I was called from my mother's womb to reveal Jesus in me that I might preach. Did you notice that that I might preach comes second to that he be revealed in me. I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. I, I preached the gospel. I've turned people from darkness to light and from the powers of Satan to the powers of God. I did the heavenly vision, but it was secondary compared to that I might reveal his son in me that I would be an expression of God. The highest level of communication is to express that divine nature. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's communication. Walk in the relationship to where you're demonstrating it, not just giving lip service. And like I said, here's, here's the mandate for Kingdom Life Church and all the people that follow us on full stature ministries. Keep in mind this one thing. 
God, this is a thus saith the Lord. Sounds funny, but it's a thus saith the Lord as far as I'm concerned. God says it's time for you to quit reading the cookbook. Start enjoying the meal, learning to eat and drink, to learn to feast and enjoy him as your supply, as your life and as your supply. Learn how that when you read the scriptures, you read, feed, and drink at the same time. It's not for the mere education of the mind. Uh, I disciple a young Harvard graduate who was doing 10 engineers jobs. They replaced 10 engineers with him. I mean, he was well above genius, not just Harvard. And I discipled him for one year, and of course he was the most fascinated was with discernment that I could read his mail and I could feel when he reacted positively or negatively to anything I said. He used to call me the claw. He said, he said but the thing that I learned that Dennis taught me, that the education of the mind comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. You have an anointing and it abides within you and it wants to teach you. Do you want to go that way or do you just want to be a head person the rest of your life? And a lot, in Christianity, a lot of the head people I run into are very proud of the fact that they're a head person because they've sustained so much by that. I'll tell you about sustain. You know what God's saying? Behold. That's with sustained attention. Behold until you are entering into the reality of it. Otherwise, you haven't known it. You need to go to the secret place to behold. You behold something with sustained attention. One of the best revelations God ever gave me was, Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention. Undivided attention. You're the apple of my eye. My thoughts are continually toward you. This is good for everybody. It's in the scripture. It's for you if you want it. I'm giving you my undivided attention. My thoughts are continually toward you. You're my special one. You're my favorite one. Yeah, individually. You're my favorite one. It's like he holds your face in his hands. I said, you're my favorite one. I never had that growing up. I had to get it from God to have someone hold me. I'm giving you my... I was ignored my whole life. Most of my early ministry had to be on rejection from a father who I was invisible but he was an illegitimate, and he was invisible to my grandfather. So it was generational. It's like he wouldn't know how to give me attention. He never got it. You can't give something you never had. So you learn to release the demand and expectation and get it from God. Releasing demands and expectations on who you think owes you, who you think should have changed, who you think should have done it differently. <clears throat> and until you release them, you're never free yourself. So to review your purpose, remember, you've got to win within before you win without. The battle within needs to be won before you're going to really be effective in the world around you. I was taken, and so were you, from your mother's womb, that he might reveal Jesus in you and through you that you might fulfill the plans and the works and the destiny that he's had for you from the, before the foundation of the earth, that he has works for you that you would walk in them. <coughs> but you win from within so that you can do like Paul, that I was taken from my mother's womb that I might reveal Jesus in me so that I might then fulfill the heavenly vision to turn people from darkness to light. Sometimes we put the preaching before and that's one of the other elements I want to get into if we have time. But, uh, <clears throat> all right, so there's a reviewing your purpose. And start with the inside purpose is more important than the external purpose. We've seen it. I've seen uh, CEOs, their whole life was their job. Then they retire. And they're, on, they're a nuisance in the neighborhood. Because they're so used to being a CEO, they do not extract that from their personality and just be a person. They walk around and check everybody else's yard and what they should be or should not be doing. It's like, stay in your own yard. Don't you understand boundaries? There's nothing worse than a retired CEO of anything whose whole life was built on what they did, not who they are. 
You, you had that kind of fertilizer in your backyard? That's, that's poison. I, I don't know. That might seep into my yard. I don't know. Get a job. Go mentor some young people who are working toward the possibility of being a CEO. Go do something with your life for others instead of minding everybody else's business. They are God's servants and not yours. They belong to him and not to you. We even had cards printed out because we saw that as a weakness when we traveled church to church, didn't we, Jennifer? This ownership thing. They are God's servants, not your mother's. This is true of your children, believe it or not. That child belongs to God. I don't get this. Oh, that's my body. Yep. Scripture says that child was an inheritance of the Lord, belongs to the Lord. You have your responsibility for your body, but he's got a responsibility for that child. They're God's servants, not yours. You do not own them. You are called to manage. You are called to a responsible relationship with them, but you're not an owner. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. And God is able to make them do as they should. God is able to teach them. Your job was to be a manager, to be a responsible oversight for them, but not a control freak, not a helicopter mom or dad that's trying to live their life through the kid. Did you get that helicopter? I said that helicopter thing to somebody and they went, oh, I don't get that part. Okay. You know what? Hovering, controlling, every move they make to where they can't make any decisions except yours. All right. You know, sometimes the best thing that can happen is let them fall down. My mother would go to smack me because I was Dennis the Menace. And I'd run because I knew I could outrun her. And I'd run. And she used to use the old Catholic thing on me. That's okay. God is just. Which I believe. He's going to get you. <laughs> All I had to do was fall off my bike and I was devastated that God, God tripped me up because my mother said he'd get me and she sent him after me. By golly, he got me. Sometimes it's better to just learn, right? <laughs> learn from your mistakes. Okay. So, lastly, that I might know him, that I might progressively become, you know, regain your, your passion. If you're, you're, you're stuck in discouragement, uh, Passion is kind of drifted away. Your, your, your fire is kind of smoke, but not much, <laughs> you know, because God, you've got to go back to God separating me from my mother's womb that I might reveal him in me. You've got to go back to that before you get carried away with what you're doing out there. Okay, that was page two of nine pages of notes, so I guess we're not going to cover everything, but I think I will... <clears throat> I will quickly give you the pathway out of the pit, right? I'm giving you some how-tos on the way. But first of all, admit it. We talked about that already, didn't we? Be 100% wrong. 90% doesn't work. It's non-redemptive. True repentance is 100%. Secondly, uh, anything that's directed toward other people, the blame game, since you got saved, the blame game is done. It no longer applies. Forgiveness goes hand in hand with the repentance. And thirdly, don't seek great things for yourself. Jeremiah 45, 5. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Don't. For I'm bringing disaster on everything living, says the Lord. But wherever you go, you will escape with your life. He told Jeremiah, don't seek for great things for yourself. I'm giving you your life. I'm giving you a life to live, and it'll be an abundant life. But don't seek for yourself. Seek for the kingdom of God in that expression. So we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full 
Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.